Okay, Renny and Laura, do you, if you want to start letting people in from the waiting room, that would be great. Bear with me while I do this. Welcome, everyone. There are 40 people in the house. No. So I can see <laughs> so far. 44. Million name. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, just to give everyone. people a few more minutes to join us. Ah, hi, Vivian. Emma, Scott, hello. Hi Vivian. <laughs> Hi Eswa. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I was just saying hi to Emma Scott. Are you still on a boat from years ago? Yep, still here. <laughs> <laughs> Great, you joined us, Emma. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I couldn't miss it. <gasps> Emma! Oh my gosh! How are you doing? <laughs> really, oh, really well. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Familiar faces. Long lost sisters. Found us. Wonderful. There's just that holding uh, message there. If anyone has any objections, of course, do say so in the chat. Um, but it pretty much says what it says. If you don't want to be recorded, then by all means, give us a holding picture or whatever. But of course, if you want to see all the beautiful faces, it just makes it so much more interesting. Well, we'll make a start. I believe. Okay, I'm going to start playing the um, the presentation and the sound now, Dion. Okay. okay. Um, I'll share my screen again in a moment. Bear with me, everybody. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us for the Sisters Doing It For Themselves project. Um, we're kindly ho being hosted by Debbie at, or from the LSC Women's Library, who's agreed to do the technical stuff. We'll ask her to show her name at some point, show herself at some point. Um, so what we're, hoping to tell you more about the project and what we've been doing and it's lovely to see um, women who are involved in it actually here so that's lovely are you okay there Debbie yeah it's fine I'm just gonna I'm just trying to get the sound and the, the presentation going at the same time so just bear with me I'm gonna press the presentation but when I do that the sound goes off so uh just didn't do this earlier when I practiced it. <laughs> Never Can does it for you? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, 
Well, if I just talk to you a little bit about the project, I mean, it would have been nice to see all the women who were involved. Um, um, that would be really great just to see um, the women who are involved and who have given their time. So WRC, we were awarded a grant in September 2019 by the National Lottery Heritage Fund to do the Sisters Doing It For Themselves project. So the project was basically about setting out and creating an oral history um, and archiving the documentation and the testimonies of what others would say unknown women um, and leaders of the London's women's charities. So in that we've interviewed um, a number of women, 15 of them to be precise, Many of you can see the pictures at the moment. And we involved schools, school girls who interviewed uh, two of uh, the women's leaders and found out more about them. So what you see before you are the women who I believe were pioneers. And we've called it a unique oral history because we've deliberately um, we deliberately chose women from the black and minoritized communities whose experiences are all too often excluded from any kind of oral history space. So we wanted to make a stand really uh, by doing that. And through the experiences and lives of 15 women who were involved in the project, um, we explored their connections between what what interested them to get them started? What was the social and political situation of the women's movement and the women's voluntary and community sector that inspired them to either start their organizations or continue in activism? The archive takes you on a journey of the London's women voluntary and community sector. And as I said, I call them pioneers. So women that you will hear from today and women that you see are on the presentations. Their role has been central in improving women's rights and gender and addressing gender inequality. So for example, women's organizations played a role in introducing um, the Abortion Act 1967 and prohibitation of female circumcision in 1985 and making rape in marriage illegal in 1991. Many of them probably wouldn't say that they uh, were um, the reasons for this to happen, but others of us that know who they are, how strong they are, we would argue that they did and had a, a massive impact. And we are really thrilled and excited that the LSC Women's Library um, has agreed to archive the digital her stories, which are Im images that you see here, the portraits, film interviews between schoolgirls and women's leaders um, and schoolgirls from Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who you're also here from today. And we are pleased to share the project's learning report together with keepsake memorabilia that will be made available after the event. You'll hear more about how this project came alive, but it was something that we needed to do and, and to document because many of the women who, as I say, were pioneers in this work um, although they will be passing the fire and flame to uh, a new generation, I think what they have done has been incredible. I hand you over to Gillian, who will introduce the LSE's work and the Women's Library's work um, and what they've done to preserve um, women's liberation. Over to you, Gillian. Thank you, Thank you Dion. Um, so I'm Gillian Murphy, I'm the Curator of Equality, Rights and Citizenship in LSE Library and I work with the Women's Library and I'm going to say a few words about the Women's Library. Um, so it was officially um, a, became a library in 1926 to preserve the history of the suffrage movement and to provide a resource for working women who wanted to improve their position in the workplace. The library is a place of deposit for collections relating to campaigns around women's rights and active citizenship. 
and the collection follows the history of feminism through the decades and you can research many different areas such as the campaign for the vote, women's education, law, women in the home, women in the church, public life, sexuality, fashion. These are just few of the topics. Um, so I remember being very excited by the initial email asking the Women's Library to support this project. And I was very pleased to see rights of women and maternity action among the list of organisations involved, as the Women's Library holds the archives of Rights of Women and Maternity Alliance, the predecessor for maternity action. And this project also dovetails very well with material we already hold around domestic abuse and we hope to increase our holdings in this area in the future. So we are looking forward to receiving a copy of this, these oral histories and photographs. And when we do, we'll be doing some technical work around them to preserve them for future generations. And after we've completed this work, we'll publish it in the digital library section of our website. So it will be freely available online later this year to anyone who would like to consult it um, with no registration or library membership required. And that's all I'm going to say, all right? Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. And if I invite, I'd like to invite uh, the head teacher Sarah from Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, and I really have to say that she was uh, incredible in um, really sticking with the program, even through lockdown and all of all of that. Um, we had another school that was meant to be involved, and all that was going on for the schools, and we all know how much pressure they were under. But uh, Sarah stuck with it, and you know I'm so pleased that uh, her girls did such a fantastic job. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Dean. Well, not as pleased as, as we were, obviously. And I just want to echo what Julian said, you know, when this opportunity dropped into the mailbox, what better experience for students at Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, ourselves named after a pioneering woman, we instill in our girls that, you know, as women, they are going to be the next generation to take forward and change the world. And the opportunity for them to work with you women has just been inspirational for them. And, and also, Dion, to echo what you said, it would have been very easy for you to give up on this project, for the girls to give up, but I think it's testimony to the quality of what you were all doing, that everybody hung in there and actively really wanted to continue this right to the very end. And I know the girls have gained so much. I know Anna is going to say something. I think that we can all, um, and particularly young people, can forget that we can be agents of change and that the heroes are amongst us. And I think for the girls, for them to see that there are people all around them who can make change is so empowering because they can do that. We can all do that. And you've really opened our eyes. I think that the lasting legacy of this, the recording of this in the, in the LSE libraries is just phenomenal. I think it's a recognition, not just of the women, but actually of your respect for the young girls who've been involved in this project, that you trust them to tell these stories. So just from us at EGA, a huge thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I spend my life surrounded by girls and to be surrounded by powerful women is just empowering and wonderful. So thank you. And I'm really looking forward to seeing, to seeing the film. Thank you. Keep doing that, don't I? Talk in when I'm on mute. <laughs> we are going to put a short video clip of the girls. Oh, did Anna Chiara, did you want to say something? Had Where you prepared something? Where is um, Anna Chiara? Good, good afternoon, everyone. <gasps> Cheers. Yeah, I'd just like to say um, a few words, if that's okay. Um, on behalf of all the EGL girls that work together on this project, I wanted to thank every single one of these hosts that brought these sessions to life for their hard work, devotion and kindness. Even if the whole world, <clears throat> sorry, even if the whole world was sadly interrupted by COVID, they managed to keep all of the sessions fun, exciting and engaging. There was always at least one thing we could take away from each activity. 
we learnt the importance of women's leadership through the interviews we were taught to conduct ourselves. Anyone can make a social change to make people's lives better. We learnt about oral history, the importance of women-led organisations like WISH and FORWARD, unconscious bias, gender inequality in the workplace and community and so much more. Some of the things that particularly stuck with some of us girls were the oral history session, as it documents more about individuals, especially as in the past, only the winners or the people who had opportunities to study wrote history. And the session in which we looked at role model traits slash characteristics, because we were able to look at successful examples of feminist leaders and identify their skills. We have now gained the confidence we need to know that we can make a change just by believing in ourselves and standing up for ourselves and each other, which will lead others to do the same. This was a fantastic opportunity that taught us all many skills we can incorporate into our daily lives and actions, like how to challenge ideas that we may disagree with and how to truly do everything with conviction and passion. Okay, I'm going to share the, um, my screen again to, um, so you can watch the video. Thank you. My name is Anna Chiara, or Anna for short, and today we are interviewing Joyce Kalavik for the Sisters Doing It For Themselves Oral History Project. Uh -huh. and we are interviewing Nana Uti Oyote. When did you first realise that you wanted to pursue a career in helping women and giving them a voice? Uh, I was a teenager in the 60s in Liverpool and that was a, a time of you know real cultural and sh uh, social change so I think I've always been a feminist uh, but my main cause has been challenging injustice um, and so I I've done that when at every opportunity. Um, hi my name is Jasmine and so why do you think teaching women's, women female leadership skills is so important in standing up to injustices and violence and in making sure change happens? Um, thank you very much, Jasmine. I think the issue of all of us, we are socialized into a world where we learn different things and we pick up from our homes, from our peers, from the media. And these things almost always makes it quite difficult for us to unpack. I mean, rights like violence against women, it weren't just taken for granted. Women had to fight for it, actually become part of the human rights of, of, of women. So yes, by teaching people in schools and learning to understand that women have rights and also women themselves, that um, you have, a, a, a role and a right to speak up and to speak up for yourself, but also others around you, not to be bystanders and for them to also uh, play a role in, in improving your rights and standing up for rights, your rights as allies as well. Oh yes, definitely. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what caused you or who caused you to become who you are today? Oh, everything. <laughs> um, well, I suppose um, I've, I've always had a lot of responsibility, um, you know, all my life. Um, so, but that gave me a lot of power as well. The two go hand in hand. A lot of people want the power, but they don't really want the responsibility. Um, I think I've never been prepared not to challenge something. 
And I think not only on a, you know, a global, a big level challenging the big injustices, but I think it's really important when you're, you know, when you see an injustice or you face something that you don't feel is okay, to challenge it in an appropriate way. Because once it's spiraled up, you know, it's already, it's already taken hold and, and it's worm. Um, next is Betty. Hi, my name's Betty, and my question for you is, what would you advise to younger females that also face social barriers? Again, um, advice to young females who face social barriers. I mean, social barriers are faced in different ways. Some people experience multiple social bar uh, barriers, uh, primarily due to um, either their race, their even ethnic group, or their color, but also sometimes their religion, or sometimes how they speak, their disability. So, so many things come together to actually make people uh, uh, have these barriers. And it's really important to almost always and let everybody, you know, stand through creating the safe spaces for learning to speak up and to know where to seek support but also to recognize that we all have power and we all have power within and to be able to work on our power. Because very often we assume that we don't have power, we are powerless, but we all have that kind of inner power that we can build on. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it has been lovely and very inspirational for us all. Thank you for your time. Um, and thank you given us the insight on your um, organization. It was very nice to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you so very much and good luck. I really felt privileged when I was called to come and speak to you. So I was really excited. I felt like, you know, Michelle Obama too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Wonderful. You know, um, oh, yeah. Really lovely. Thank you, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. And thank you, Sarah. And thank you, girls. You did a fantastic job. Let me just say the girls came up with those questions themselves. They weren't written for them. They came up with the questions themselves and with the support of Evelina and Tebs, who ran the feminist work, feminist leadership workshops. And uh, is it Rosa, who ran the, um, the oral histories sessions. Um, the, the girls just took that, absorbed all that they could, and uh, then presented back what you just saw. It's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. <gasps> okay, does anyone want to say anything? Or, I don't know. I'm just really emotional these days. Must be the menopause. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not going to start tearing up soon. Uh, but if anyone wants to say anything at this stage before we go into panel discussion, um, then by all means, unmute, say something. I think I found it very inspirational. And I wish speaking as an older woman that I had had that same opportunity when I was younger. But what it does is it gives me so much hope for the future to see young women speaking so clearly, so insightfully and so powerfully gives me great hope. Thank you, Jocelyn. Anybody else before we go into panel discussion? Uh, yes, yeah, I'd like to say something. Oh, Tabs, how you doing? Hello. Uh, thank you for that name drop. It was lovely. I just wanted to say, so I'm Tebs, and jointly with Evelina, we, we had the privilege, and I want to use that word, the privilege to work with these young women. Um, and I think it's it's young women like that that keep us going, you know, knowing that they they have that same vision, that they want to make that change. And the energy, wow, we were blown away. And I, I think I've been in the room, I'm sure she'll echo mm. what I'm saying. We were blown away with the energy and the passion and the understanding and the wanting to know more. Like you say young people are like sponges. This is a, a real demonstration. So I want to say thank you to the girls 
for being present in those sessions, for giving the contributions, for putting their mind to it. And I really look forward to kind of seeing, you know, how they grow up to be uh, the leaders that we we're talking about, already leaders, not knocking that at all, but the leaders to make such kind of those big changes we're talking about in society and policy and politics and all those spaces. So thank you. Yeah, can I also just sort of come in and just echo that basically? It was like I'm sitting here and I'm quite emotional, so I'm keeping my camera off. Um, but it was an absolute uh, like privilege, just as Teb said, to be working with these girls. Uh, I learned so much from them and also just the hope in the future. Like, um, I just feel like there are so many women around us and also girls around us. And like, I learned from them and I felt yeah, I, I can't really express myself as uh, elegantly as um, anyone else, but um, yeah, it was just an absolute privilege. And thank you so much to the girls for your courage, for your eagerness to learn, for your resilience, um, for your sharing of knowledge. Um, it was just an absolute pleasure. So thank you so much. Lovely. Oh, I think I... Uh... Yeah, there's just want to mention one thing in the report that I don't know which one of the girls that said it um, in the evaluation report. And I believe Anita's on the, the call as well. And so is Phoebe, who did the filming, uh, made the films, uh, Molly, who put the, um, the audios together. So, you know, there's so many people involved in making this happen. But of course, it wouldn't have happened without Sarah and it wouldn't have happened without the girls. So, um I just think that there was one thing that stood out to me and I can't remember the exact words, but it was something about, it was so nice from one of the girls to see a Muslim woman doing feminist leadership. When I was reading the port, I was like, oh my gosh, wow. I just got goosebumps there. I just just got goosebumps there. No joke, that is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It stood out for me. Like Evelina, I'm going to switch off my camera in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, let's crack on to the um, panel discussion unless anyone would like to contribute, but hopefully we'll have time to do that. So uh, we've got an audience here with five women who joined me um, in me asking them questions and we're just going to have a conversation and if you'd like to put your questions in the chat or maybe unmute to 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 say anything about the questions that we have um we're all sisters in the house so um yeah i've i've got some provocative questions and they may look at me strangely as i as i pose those questions but it's fine so i'm joined by nana roz sarvjet Esua and Joyce in a panel discussion. And I'm hoping that it'll be food for thought. So my first question to the panel members, um, before I do that, if you unmute and introduce yourself briefly, because I don't feel like I need to do that. You have a voice and so you can introduce yourself. Okay, Roz. Hi, I'm Ros Bragg. I'm Director of Maternity Action, um, organisation advisors on maternity rights at work for benefits. And we do a lot of work with refugee and asylum seeking women about accessing healthcare and other forms of support. Pass to Esawa. Hi, I'm Eswan Swa Jane Goldsmith, you can call me Eswa, and uh, I'm the director of Anana Development Consultancy, and I work um, locally, nationally, internationally with all sorts of uh, organisations, primarily women's feminist organisations and uh, minoritised groups um, and international um, agencies. And I'm uh, looking at um, strategy and taking a holistic view of the impact we make and what we, uh, ha- who we work with, how we work and engaging uh, with people at every level. And I'm just coming up to 25 years uh, in this uh, job and uh, still going. So quarter of a century. <laughs> Pass the mic to 
Joyce. Hi, uh, my name is Joyce Kalavik, and I'm the, I've got the great privilege of being the director of WISH, um, which is a women's user-led mental health organisation. Um, WISH has been in existence for over 30 years, and I've been with WISH for 20 years. And honestly, you know, being paid to do the work I do is just incredible, because It's an opportunity to make a difference. Um, the frontline work we do with women, it makes me realize how strong these women are, not how weak the fact that they have come through so much and they're still moving forward. And it, to be part of this project has been a great honor as well. Um, you know, to be, and to be working or to be interviewed by the girls, it was very challenging, um, but very exciting. And it's great to reflect as well how, you know, what impacted on you, what made you do what you do. Um, so thank you, everybody, WRC and the girls at, um, at the school. Thank you very much. Pass the mic to. Sarjit. Um, hello, uh, my name is Sarjit and I'm the director of the Asian Women's Resource Centre. Um, we provide um, support services, advice and advocacy, employability workshops and a whole range of holistic services for women, including kind of advice and information uh, to black and minoritized women. Actually, our organization is celebrating 40 years um, this year. So it initially started in the 80s as a refuge and resource center. So, you know, it's a huge milestone that the organization has um, kind of reached. And, I, you know, I have to say, you know, a huge, huge thank you to Women's Resource Center for, you know, engaging us as a small specialist um, organization in this project and be, part, you know, stand on a platform with so many kind of like amazing women. I think it's just been, uh, an amazing, um, you know, self-development aspect for, for me, but also an opportunity for, for us to celebrate the work that we do. So thank you very much. It's a huge, huge honour to be part of this project. Pass the mic to... Nana. Hello, it's so exciting to be here. My name is Nana Otsu Oyote. It was exciting to be famous through this film, so I'm really grateful to the Young Lady Women-Led Organization and uh, tackling multiple forms of uh, violence to women and girls, particularly uh, female genital mutilation. And uh, we've increasingly seen through our work the need to address multiple forms of violence because we And to sort of be dumped with women. And to have multiple forms. And so that's because I have multiple forms for 35 years. Um, I've been part of Forward at 20 years, uh, mainly as a volunteer and in the recent years as the director. Our work really is around provision of services, engagement of communities, because we believe firmly that uh, communities have the uh, hold the, the key to shifting social norms that fuel all these forms of abuse. And very often, just looking at just support services, you're not able to address the wider community values that uh, really reinforce uh, a women's vulnerability. Um, we also work particularly with young women and young women leadership has been a key part of our work in the last 10 years, enabling young women to have a voice and to really um, give them the leadership platform to actually uh, lead change in different ways. And that has been exciting uh, for us uh, to really work with women. We also look at the need for intergenerational dialogue and working with community women. I think what has been our price work has really been community partnership and enabling and working with community partners to lead change. And this is something that we feel we need to 
raise uh, uh, others with us and to work with others in this pathway to fame. It's been exciting being part of this project, uh, being called to be part of this project. I loved having to have my picture taken. It's importantly, it was really lovely working with me and really enjoyed every stage of this uh, project. So thanks uh, WRC for also reaching out to us and uh, we'd love to continue to share our story. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I will answer the question. So you've got, I don't know, X amount of years between you. So when I ask the question uh, or my questions, then I'm gonna get such rich answers, aren't I? Yes, I am. Um, and yes, big up to Wassie if she's on the line. Photography is fantastic. All the team, I think, are on here and they deserve a fantastic round of applause, trust me. Uh, working with me is not easy. Anyway, for, for another day. So, here's my question. Was it, and it's, this is particular to Sarvjit, Roz, um, and Essawa, because I believe some of this was it picked up in the uh, video for Joyce and Nana. So was there any event, any occurrence that prompted you to become an activist or start your organization? For example, was it the um, opening of the Chiswick Refuge, Women's Refuge in 1971? Did that play any part? What was the occurrence that kind of happened that got you to start your organization or become an activist? Subject. Okay, um, I remember about 20 years ago, um, I went to, this was in Brent, um, I went to a public meeting which was held by Southall Black Sisters at the time, and it was, um, it was the, about the murder of Balwant Kaur, who was residing in the Brent Refuge, and what had happened was that her partner had actually discovered, you know, he followed um, the woman, when she went to pick up her children from school, he followed her into the refuge and basically she was killed in, uh, in a cold blood at that time. So obviously that raised a lot of issues around protection of women um, and just safety of women. So I remember going into a, a, a public meeting and I remember being inspired by so many women. It was actually the first time I'd actually heard the, the term domestic abuse. Uh, and and I felt, my goodness, there was just so much passion. There was just so much uh, commitment to kind of create and influence change in terms of the protection of women. And I think that that was quite a pivotal point for me um, in looking at addressing, you know, the, the Vogue Violence Against Women and Girls at that time and just being inspired by so many women at that time that was pushing for more protection and more safety for women. So I think that would be my, um, that would be my uh, most vivid kind of memory and why it kind of like got me to be involved in, in this work. And so when a position came up as a, a, a youth worker in the Asian Women's Resource Centre, I applied for the job. And it, it, again, I started off by saying privilege and honour, and it is being a privilege and, and uh, being an honour to, you know, to actually do this kind of work. And, and as somebody, a colleague said earlier on, to actually do something that you love and actually see some change and be involved in influencing, I think that makes it more special. Esawa, the same question. Let me unmute myself. Yeah, it's it's just fantastic to be part of this project. Uh, and I I think um, what inspired me was uh, Anna Chiara's uh, um, uh, presentation, which I know all of us were really tearing up at that because actually I can remember I was... Uh, I remember exactly the time, place and date I became a feminist. I was 15. I was in the middle of a tiny little cottage in the middle of a snowstorm in Norfolk, reading uh, Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex. And I was seething with rage. I just could not understand the world around me. I was uh, born to a white um, single mother, disabled single mother in an unmarried mother's home. 
Uh, I was the only black kid on the block and I was completely felt like I'd been dropped from out of space. By the time I was 15, I was really on the rampage. So they sent me to an auntie in the country where it was even whiter than white. And I was sitting in, the, in my little room and I suddenly remembered I had this book that somebody gave me. I read it all night and in the morning, Simone de Beauvoir made me into a feminist. I, it just explained the world to me and what I got to do in life. So by the time I got to uh, uh, the 1971 with the, uh, uh, the Chiswick Refuge, I was already 18 and I'd already, you know, had a lot of um, struggles with um, my, uh, my, the world outside, which just wasn't, didn't make sense to me apart from through a, a feminist lens and an intersectional lens. Although the word hadn't been invented at that time, you know, as a little brown girl, I had had an understanding of how uh, you get an intersectional uh, experience of oppression. So by the time I got to university, I started university when I was in 1972. I joined the women's liberation movement. We were fighting the rugby club even then. And then I, after that, I went on VSO and I can remember some of the Tanzanian women in uh, um, Africa that I worked with then so inspired me that that was it, you know, intersectionality, feminism and internationalism, that was me. And, and it happened very young. And of course, everybody thought I was bonkers because nobody was thinking or talking like that at all around me. And it's just such a pleasure to be here. You know, sisters in the house, as somebody said, just knowing that actually I was right, you know, <laughs> however many years <laughs> on, 50 years on or whatever, there's many, many more of us. There's a whole worldwide movement. It's really, really exciting, but that's when it kicked off for me. And I wish I'd had a project like this when I was 15, 16, that would have made my day. It would have made my life, I tell you. Thank you. And Rose? I have a much less exciting conversion to feminism. Um, I think for me it was as a very young woman just looking around and seeing the economic inequalities that women were facing and it was just everywhere. There was this expectation that women would do the work that didn't get paid. Um, They'd be blamed somehow for not having the economic power that followed on from doing the work that didn't get paid, the expectation that childcare would be their primary responsibility. So many women who struggled to get access to the workforce at all. And the consequences of that for women's lives, so poverty in old age, is an almost inevitable consequence of, you know, compelling women to work in jobs which just don't pay. So I was really interested in how that worked. And I think that led me into that sense of the whole way in which women are confined and constrained um, and the ways in which power operates in so many different ways within the community, um, just on a day-to-day -day basis. So for me, it was that starting point of um, just the sheer difficulty of making women's lives work within the economic frameworks that we use, which is really how I ended up working um, in a maternity rights charity, because it's when women have babies that they find themselves in really the most greatest difficulty at work. That's where the gender pay gap is um, really starts. If, if women didn't have babies, you wouldn't be seeing quite such a large gap. It's at that point that women who have children will earn less than other women, let alone earning less than men. And men, of course, earn more than other men if they have babies. The, the, the division between men and women at that point is extraordinary. And I think it's just, I think why I've become increasingly um, active over the years because of the sheer frustration at watching these inequalities just embedded year on year on year. We keep thinking there's this sense of progress, but if you start looking at the stats and you start looking at women's stories about their lives, it's just not happening. We're seeing these things become in, entrenched in different ways but really we're still dealing with a lot of some of those fundamental questions that I think got me first um, engaged in feminism um, back when I was a young woman. Thank you. Um, there's a question here that I'm going to touch on. I am an SOA kind of led to the, uh, a, le a nice lead on to this question. But we're often asking the women's sector, what is so special about the specialist? So my question is this, it's, 
what does intersectionality or um, overlap and discrimination mean to you? And how does this reflect in the work that the women's sector does? Or maybe your organisation does? I would put that question to Nana. First. Okay. Oh. Um, your host, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, for me, it, it's also about responding to the women that uh, have multiple and complex needs. And over and over again, we are seeing that we have women who may have been through female genital mutilation, uh, may also have come here as refugees, uh, may have had a lot of trauma through their journey, maybe through conflict. Uh, would them come here and would have no English, uh, so they would have barriers in terms of access and uh, services, and uh, will then also often, particularly if they have no recourse to public funds, will really not be able to also access mainstream services. So we are seeing a lot of complex issues, and the fact that a lot of them would also live in families where the social norms prescribe so much for them. So we see multiple layers and, and, and different challenges around even being able to access services. So it's important that assessing the multiple barriers and, and, and factors and the root causes that create these kind of inequalities and discrimination. And I would say vulnerabilities uh, are so important and we shouldn't take a one size fits all approach, assuming that everybody has similar needs and similar constraints. And so tailoring these to specific needs of women requires a much more nuanced approach. And that is why adopting values and things around a holistic approach, being able to tackle trauma that women have faced, but also creating safe environment for women and girls to be able to you know, have their voice, have that sister who would be empowered and to exercise their rights. So it's not just saying that it's a one-off thing, you know, I come in for a service. It's about how do you ensure that that woman or her multiple needs are addressed. And I think for me, that's how our services are different. So the woman, I mean, recently we had a woman who we had to sort of work with her for about a year before she could even come forward to even accepting uh, counseling because in her, her sphere of life, counseling was you know, only for mad people or something like that. So again, you're seeing that you have to break all these barriers and she doesn't have English and uh, most of the counseling would almost always have the language that she needs or even what is used is very much Eurocentric. So we've had to sort of even ensure that our therapies are very much suitable to the women who are women and girls. And recently we even had to adopt a, a young women's service, primarily because there is a, a real barrier for young women accessing services. And it's those who are experiencing mental health who come from communities of, of uh, uh, color, they would definitely come with issues around you know, lack of voice, uh, not able to also speak up in, within their families, identity issues. So we are seeing these multiple things and you do have to tailor the needs uh, to the services that we provide. So leadership is so central and giving the voice an agency to be able to access and speak out. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone would add uh, what makes the specialist so special yeah. in how we approach the work? Um, yeah, I, I think it's really important that, um, you know, specialist uh, organisations actually use intersectionality as a uh, kind of analytical tool in terms of understanding oppression, in terms of, you know, how women are, disc are discriminated against because of their race, their colour, their caste or sexual orientation. And I think also, it's really important that when you think about specialist organizations, you know, we have that understanding of how inequalities manifest and how they discriminate against women. And I think we are those women. We are those women that are working in that sector to try and address those in inequalities. You know, there's no one going to come and, you know, do it for us. So, so I think that that's been really important. Only recently, I've been doing the job for 20 years, and only recently um, I knew about, you know, empowerment and providing support and addressing honour-based violence and forced marriages. 
but I never really understood it in terms of the theoretical, you know, what was what was it and why why we did use intersectionality. We used to just do it because that was our work. We wanted to provide women a voice. We wanted to make sure that we 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 influence change. But I think it was really important to understand all of the kind of women that have worked tirelessly to get us to where we are just even coining those kind of um kind of uh, words like intersectionality and then really applying that in our day-to-day -day work so for me it was really about uh you know actually trying to also um say why we're specialist if you see what I mean you know mm -hmm. intersectionality means to me is it's a it's a, it's a tool which, which says yes what we do as a specialist organization is important because of our understanding of inequalities so yeah I think it's really been important and it's really made me more aware of you know how you know how we are influencers as leaders of organizations and how it comes with a lot of responsibility in terms of creating change listening to the women you know talking with them finding out from them, what are some of the issues? And then, you know, trying to kind of advocate and push doors, if you like, you know, whether it's for the commissioners for funding, whether it's the kind of um, um, uh, funders or government, you know, we do need to make that push because we've still got quite a long way to go. Can I just come in there and... Uh... Um, support what uh, both Nana and Subject said. It's about, um, it's a completely different way of looking at what organisations are, who they're for and what they're for and what they're supposed to be doing. It seems to me that a lot of services are done to women uh, rather than engaging women, um, by women, for women, led by women, women who actually understand because we are part of we are part of it we're part of a whole movement so to me women's organizations are different because we're part of a worldwide movement for liberation and transformation and also we have uh, at our best it doesn't always work but at our best we have the kind of structures and the kind of ways of working which involve and engage and enable women to take the lead themselves in their own healing and their own solidarity and also we provide very different uh, feminist models. If you even look at, like, like Nana was saying about therapy, um, most therapy is offered along Western white models, which have absolutely no relevance or use to, um, well, most women actually, you know, let's face it, it's about social control. It's about fitting in, you know. Um, and so it seems to me that it's a very patriarchal model. And what we are doing is bringing along an empowerment model, which is very, very different. And one of the things that we talk about, um, we fall into the trap of talking about all our successes oh well we changed this law and that happened and we got one a woman into that and that but actually the thing that I think we need to think about in terms of success is how many women get involved in women's organizations and feel empowered that come in feeling broken and go out feeling like they can take on the world and they are healed. So it just seems to me, well, I guess healing doesn't just happen like that, but you know, you get what I mean, that it gets women on a journey. And to me, that's our biggest success. That's what we've got to offer. It doesn't matter how much value for money or blah, 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 any other organization is, that's what the women's sector does. We are part of a transformational movement. That, that, that's what does it for me. Thank you. Does anybody else want to add to that before I'm moving into the next question? Okay. So then how do we, now we've, 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 we've know that others, other organizations and companies from different sectors, they want to dance on this parade. They want to join the party and a lot of them are winning lots of funds. Um, and that's, you know, that's probably another story for another day, but how can non-sector specific organizations affect change um, and the structural um, position for women and girls? Because if they're gonna take on this work 
and claim that they can do this work, which many of them can't, um, what would you say to them? How would they, how should they do this? Anyone jump in? I might jump in on this. Um, I've only got a partial answer, but I'd say one thing I'd say is to start saying to those organisations, what are you doing for the women who work for you right now? Because as an organisation that advises pregnant women and new mothers on rights of work and benefits and all that sort of thing, there's an astoundingly large number of charities whose staff end up coming to us for advice about poor treatment at work. So I think there is something about actually looking at how you live your values um, as an organisation. And um, certainly there's been a few women's organisations come through the door, but it's very, very unusual. It's much more common to have organisations which just take a very um, old school approach to their role of working. And I think it's very hard to go out there and try and improve the lives of women, work with women when you're not doing a good job supporting your own staff. Um, I'd like to just um, uh, uh, come in, if that's okay, um, Dion. Uh, I think one of the things uh, for us as a specialist organisation, when I think about work around uh, no recourse to public funds, I mean, that, in a, in a, in a way, we, we the, in terms of COVID, it's actually kind of sh shown a light on women who have no recourse to public funds in terms of the inequalities they experience. I really just want to say that actually, in a way, no recourse to public funds is a piece of work that black women's organisations have done for years. You know, it's been it's never been recognised. People just do it in the in the sector because they care about the work and and, and they're aware of how um, women are disadvantaged. But I think part of that also is to allow the specialist services to do what they do best rather than taking on that work as um, sort of mainstream organizations, work in collaboration with you know, specialist providers and actually leave some of that specialist work for the specialist organization to do. Um, and yeah, and also to really address some of that as well in terms of you know, unequal playing fields um, in the funding regime. There are you know, some organizations that, you know, claim quite a lot of the money that's out there and then you've got some of the small organizations that are still with you know just valuable work but actually you know they're not recognized so I think what I'm saying is people need to be aware of their privilege and their uh, uh, and also try to address some of that status quo by you know allowing specialist organizations to do what they do. Um, can, I, can I add on to yeah no okay. Joyce go on. Um, Let's go ahead. Well, I don't think any organisation can do something for other people. You've got to take, you know, you've got to take women with you. You've got to take women's organisations with you. You've got to raise the expectation of women having their voice raised and listening to that. So in, in the disabled people's movement, it's nothing about us without us. Um, and I think it's got to be the same for the, you know, for the women's sector as well. Um, it, it's, I mean, I've got an example of how little power um, could be given to women. Um, we got some funding um, after the women's mental health strategy was launched and we wanted to go into hospitals, secure hospitals, and we wanted to enable um, women to review the policies to make them more gender specific. And we got some funding and we went along to the hospitals and we had this, um, it was a, a, a quite a provocative um, title to the project. It was, um, it was about, it was, it was put uh, policy into practice, keeping on track. It was about the women saying, let's look at your policies. How do they take us? There were women's hospitals, women's mental health. How do they take us into account? Let us inform you. We've got power. We've got insight. Um, and we couldn't even get in the hospital with that project title name because it was perceived that women will be giving, were, were being given power, which they weren't entitled to. And we had to change the name of the project to voices, actions, solutions together. And it was so heartbreaking, you know, to be able to, you know, to have 
spoken to the women and for them not to be able to go into that project with power. And I just think um, organisations have got to take women and women's organisations with them in terms of, you know, uh, in supporting change. Institutional sexism is, you know, very hard to change. And it's about enabling women themselves to change it as well as the institutions to move forward. So policy is one thing, but practice is another. Thanks. Thank you, Joyce. That's, um, yeah, it's interesting, but um, there's lots of organizations that are claiming that they can do this work. Um, and lots of funders that actually think that they can until of course, you know, they have a uh, safeguarding issues by those organizations. And then they come to the women's sector and say, can you resolve this problem? Um, and, and by the way, you're gonna get uh, a limited fund to do this. But Dion, can I just um, say also, there's something about, you know, I've sp you know, spent the last, I don't know, 25 odd years trying to go into organizations and doing their diversity and inclusion and their, you know, anti-sexism and anti-racism policies and their big strategies and so on. And I've come to the conclusions that the organizations themselves don't work. We have the institution itself is institutional. It's, it's based on patriarchal capitalist and white supremacist assumptions most of them are you know even feminist ones we've got structures that are not fit for the 21st century and I think that is the problem that we can do processes we can do strategies we can do oh yeah we're committed to black lives matter or whatever but it seems to me that unless you actually dismantle the structures themselves and start to think how can we get a new set of structures that actually work for people, which actually empower people? Because it seems to me that everything about the language and the uh, and the processes and the systems is set up to actually control people rather than to enable them. And I think that's the problem. We're fighting a bit of a losing battle there. So I'm now going into organizations and saying, I'm not gonna work with you unless you actually are on a journey to change yourselves radically and fundamentally uh, rather than simply do a patch up job. So I think, you know, time for revolution girls. We, we you know. <laughs> We we tried all um, the other things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I am also astounded at the amount of um, um, how the black agenda is so in at the moment, so hip. Oh, right. let's go and create our anti-racist practice. Let's do a policy. Let's, uh, you know, as they hadn't had equality and diversity policy before, you know, still nothing change, changes. Um, so absolutely. Um but we are the revolutionaries, women. <laughs> and I have a question here, which is, I'm not getting anything from the chat. I don't know if anything's coming through YouTube. Are there any questions anybody has? There's comments, there's there great com question. comments. Um, so yeah, there was a question in the chat, I'm just trying to find it. It was from uh, Sarifa Patel. Yeah, Sarifa Patel. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, as disabled women, um, mm -hmm. a lot of um, inequality happens for us, um, especially if you're from the women of colour. Um, we face a lot of barriers at work, um, at um, home, um, addressing our needs, if, especially if they're hidden disabilities and not visible. So, um, you know, I was just wanted to know how, and it's a global thing, it's not just Britain thing, I think it's a global issue. Um, and if you've got disabled children, it's a bigger issue because automatically they think you can't cope with your children once you start asking for help. So they put you on child protection. And I was just wondering whether, you know, your organization have thought about this and how do we help these most vulnerable group of women um, I don't even like using the word vulnerable because given the right support, we're not vulnerable, but it's because we're not being supported. So how, you know, like the lady said, nothing about us without us, but yet our voices are very seldomly heard. So, Do you want to answer that one, Joyce? Start us off. Um, 
Well, the disabled people's movement is, is very strong and does enable uh, disabled people to have a voice and challenges. I suppose the thing is the structural in inequalities are in society or in the government, aren't they? And it's not like, it's not that um, we can't, it, it's, it's almost, it, it, it does almost need revolution because it's about, you know, rocking the status quo. It's about changing things fundamentally. Um, and um, there are, there are strong organisations, Zarifa. Do you, do you belong to any organisations where you feel that your voice is being heard? Are you there, Sharifa? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes yeah. Sir. Do you feel you've got, uh, have you got local support? Yeah, I have. Um, I'm okay for support, but I'm just saying that over the years, it's been really hard. I've had to find my own support. But for somebody that's coming from another country and is disabled, and um, it's just, you know, there isn't that much for disabled women. Um, and, um, and like even refugees sometimes don't have the accessible um, hmm. rooms for us and things like that so I just think we're left behind a bit I think you know as, as women's organizations say. I think we've got just got to be more inclusive we've got to make sure we're inclusive of everyone um and that you know that's not about policy really it's about practice it's about in, um reviewing your service who's being included who's not being included um, and it, it, I know it is, I know I, I, my background's in the disabled people's movement. So I, you know, understand how, how difficult it can be. Um, it's about having enough grassroots organizations. It's about having enough user led organizations. It's about, um, but of course all, all these organizations are very poorly funded. Um, and it, it's harsh it is harsh um but we can only move forward by supporting you know campaigning and supporting the women's sector to be stronger raising women's voices and making change happen not just talking about it but actually you know making it happen at every opportunity are you okay now is that okay my other question for you. Uh, uh, Dion, can I, just, can I just say something just on that same point, if that's okay, Dion? Um, I mean, Sh Sharitha, I, I mean, I, I do, I, it's, it's, it's brilliant that you've raised, raised that point. And as Joyce said, I think we need to get better at looking at supporting um, women with disabilities. I know for my organization, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, as leaders, you know, we've got to make sure that we 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 actually monitor, you know, the kind of uptake of uh, women with disabilities or L LBGTQ communities. So we're looking at that constant. But, you know, sometimes because of the pressures, the funding and all of that, you know, we put our hands up, you know, sometimes, you know, we we don't we take the eye off the ball but I think you're absolutely right you know we do need to look at that we need to to look at how we're making our organizations accessible I mean for years our organization based in Halsden we didn't even have uh, full access you know luckily and part of that was because of funding but fortunately we were able to get funding for that so that's that's been a really small minute step you know and sometimes you know, we kind of like think, well, maybe we need to kind of have loads and loads of money. And I know that we need, we could be doing lots of other things without that money, for example, making our websites a little bit more accessible, but actually more importantly, looking inward, how are we reaching out to black and minoritized women who have disabilities? And, you know, frankly, we do have a long way to go. And I talk from my organization. Thank you, Sarbjit. Anybody else want to contribute before I move to the next question? And it's probably follow on from that, um, as in investors. 
But I just want to quickly say, we're always looking for grant funding. Should there be other ways that we try to raise our own income? I don't know how, I don't have the solution, but I think, you know, we're looking for, 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 for grant funding. But maybe there's something that we need to come together as not just for the revolution, but to think about how do we do that as the women's sector um, and raise our own income, perhaps in some kind of financial vehicle or, or something. I don't know. But um, so my next question follow on is, you know, how should grant funders investors acknowledge how important is it for grant funders and investors to acknowledge and act on discrimination in their work? In, to tackle inequality and, and inequity. So there's lots of funders who pigeonhole a lot of their money towards one thing and say, right, you need to be working in that area on homelessness. So you can't have any money for anything else. How is it important for us to make them understand that that doesn't work and can't work, bearing in mind the sector works as empowering women on, on the whole? What can we do to help them change how they uh, fund? Us. I think they can come on events like this <laughs> so they can actually directly hear from women and their experience on that. Yes. They never do. They're a bit frightened, many of them. And Anna? Oh, she's frozen. Subject. Yeah, I think I think I think Nana was trying to speak, and that's why I kind of like uh, was just giving her some space. Uh, areas um, where funders. Oh, she's on. frozen. Am I frozen? Oh, are you back? Yeah, I think I'm having problems oh. with my internet. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, the floor's yours, Nana. Yes, I'm having problems with my internet. I think it's important that in some areas, funders definitely have to, you know, allocate funding for specific uh, issues and to prioritize. And this is about having conversations with funders to prioritize needs of uh, vulnerable and uh, marginalized women. And we're talking about disability. And one of the things that recently came up, uh, Forward was doing training for young women in, in Uganda. And we had to bring in, you know, uh, somebody who did sign reading to be able to help uh, a one woman who uh, 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 was disabled to be able to attend the training. It costs a lot, but you have to factor in that cost. And a lot of times there's a lot of just generic funding, which doesn't really meet these nuanced needs or different people. So it's important that we have these conversations. Now, if you talk about having to just give a, a, a funding, um, because uh, we, we don't even have these conversations with funders. I mean, it's just a privileged organizations that have the space to have these conversations with funders. And I think there needs to be a shift in terms of having access and to be able to have these kinds of conversations around what it really means. And these structural barriers makes it difficult for these needs of, I mean, these intersectional needs to really come up. And I think in terms of investing, yes, we provide a lot of services that others can buy in. But if you're working with vulnerable, marginalized women who cannot pay for these services, now you're looking at women with no recourse to public funds. How are they going to deliver and pay for these services? So repeatedly, you're seeing that as the, you know, the minoritized sector, we are actually having to sort of work with these communities because nobody else wants to take them on. And because they say we can't have used public funds for that. But it then means that somebody has to provide the public funds for that to happen. And seriously, the sector is in such a, a space that they, it's challenging to look at, you know, like for example, training. We provide a lot of training, we provide a lot of technical support. And I think it's hard time that we do uh, uh, provide these kind of services to be paid. And a lot of times you see that the, our time is never paid for. You invited for consultations, you invited for meetings and things. Nobody pays for this. And they expect somebody to pay for you to attend these meetings. And so it's important to realize that even the approach and how they deal with us in terms of, <laughs> of the women's sector, we are, pro we are actually supposed to continue providing that care, support without necessarily being funded. So it's important that I think when we talk about funding, 
we have to really look at what is really happening and who is getting the, the, the pies and who is just getting the crumbs. And those who are getting the crumbs are supposed to be delivering most. So we just have to have a change and a shift in, uh, of these of thinking. Um, I'd yeah. like to add to that. I think one of the really big problems we see is that funders, indeed, you know, a lot of groups like to see an evidence base when you say that there's a need in the community that you're working with. And of course, you can show a very basic sort of evidence base from, you know, calls to your advice line, the sorts of issues raised, you can do some focus groups and things, but that's often not sufficient. You need to show a much more um, substantial yeah. evidence base. Um, and, and it's possible to produce that, but that costs money. You need to have the expertise in the organisation. You need to have the time available to put that together. Often there's quite substantial pieces of research to be able to demonstrate need, particularly amongst very vulnerable women, um, because they're not the sort of women who are going to fill out an online survey. You know, you've actually got to go through a much more substantive process. And so it's a big barrier, I think, to communicating to funders precisely what is being we're dealing with on the ground. We do a lot of work with migrant and asylum seeking women who are charged for NHS maternity care, scared off by bills of £7,000 or more for their care. And these are women who do not want to engage with the state. They're fearful of being um, reported to the Home Office and deported. So how you go about proving <laughs> the need that's there and be able to sort of communicate this to funders is a huge problem. Yeah, I, I, I do um, agree with you, Ros. I think that um, uh, we need to change the whole way that funding is seen. It just seems to me that um, it's a largely extractive thing. Even though the donors are giving money, they want an awful lot back for that in terms of evidence base and uh, choosing the things they want to fund in the way they want to fund them. They have uh, funding uh, schedules which don't meet the needs of organisations. Um, and it seems to me we need to change the dialogue completely to a rights-based approach, an intersectional rights-based approach, meaning that we're reaching all women and that is, it is women's right to have the means to flourish and not just to survive. Um, and, and you have to change that whole dialogue so that it's not the donors who are the ones that you need to be accountable to. It's the people, it's the women who actually are the partners, the women's organizations are the partners and the women who are actually at the receiving age of uh, uh, end of all of this, you know, to what extent is it transforming their lives? And if it's not, it's not hitting the mark. So it seems to me we can be a lot more creative. There's a lot more uh, better models for funding rather than just the sort of, you know, he here's a here's a, a donation over three years and, and uh, according to uh, the donor's needs. Um, you've got um, models for flexible funding, peer funding grants where other organizations decide who gets the money. Uh, you've got um, women setting the agenda and um, the level of funding and the amount and the, you know, uh, uh, and when it comes in and so on and setting their own funding cycles. So to me, it's again, um, a structural um, and institutional issue that, um, and the problem lies with the funders themselves and their attitudes. And the other thing I would like to say is uh, in, around um, uh, inclusion. I have a problem with that word because I think it's about in being included in a system that never wanted us and always uh, rejects us and tries to fit us into a standard model of white, male and, you know, rich and straight and all of that. It just seems to me we don't want to be included in that. We, I think the women's liberation movement was about transformation. We don't want to be included in that world. We want to be included in a world which we know is truly inclusive and that is along a feminist model so in a way I think our job is to get the donors to become feminists and to treat and to and to approach uh, funding on a feminist model and we've got to put those models before them and you know and say this is what we need uh, there's a big report just come out saying that in the international aid sector people get sent things that they can't use and didn't want and didn't ask for and they go and flog them on the market and buy what they really need I mean this is insane you know we we We've got to really do something about it at that very fundamental level, I think.
Yeah. Uh, that's fine, Cinti. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else, but I do have one last question about, well, what's our future? Uh, but yes, Joyce, if you'd like to come in here, and I'm hoping that we're getting some questions in the chat. Doesn't seem like we are, unless I've missed them. Go ahead, Joyce. Um, well, when I first started working in with um, user-led charities, funders, charitable trust funders were much more in touch. The process was easier. They, you know, understood um, better the needs of the organization and it wasn't a, a one size fits all and now it's spiraled up to the extent that if unless you've got professional fundraisers um you know a to un understand the forms some of the government forms that absolutely well I'm not going to mention any by name but we were going to apply for something and we had you know the greatest minds in the country trying to understand this form and it just wasn't you know it was incomprehensible um you know funders have got to be in touch with grassroots organizations with understand the work that we do with women with mul multiple and complex needs it's not bums on seats job we're not going to get through 100 women and get them up and out and on you know it's you know if we work in a, a very intensive way and an empowering way with women, um, with an, a smaller number of women, enable them to step into their own power, to, to thrive, not survive, you know, and not this revolving door of never having enough services. And then the women's sector comes in, steps in, they subsidize the services. Women maybe get to a place that they feel a bit more in control, they've got a bit more direction, and then boom, the, rug, the rugs just pulled out from under their feet by discriminatory statutory services who don't understand human rights or under or respect women they don't validate their experiences so from wishes perspective you know the statutory sector with all that funding you know just undermines women really and charitable trusts have got to really you know, gain insight. There are, there are a group of charitable trust funders who are more aware of user-led issues and being in touch with that aspect. But it's not enough because these big organisations are mega bucks and absolutely, you know, it's all sprinkling, you know, fairy dust over everything and not really doing, you know, talking the talk, but definitely not walking the walk. And lastly and briefly... Briefly, that is one minute. How do you see the future of the women's sector considering the building pressures of uh, competitive commissioning, the funding cuts, COVID-19, Brexit and all other issues that are about to come to the fore more and other issues? How do you see the future for the women's sector when we're grappling with all that as well as trying to empower our women and, yeah, it sounds to me that we need a revolution of some kind. And it sounds to me that we need to create a new model because no one's going to create it for us. But I'm going to leave that. So if you all, if you're on the spotlight, Joyce, if you could just say that, give me an answer in one minute. And then we've gone well, less than one minute because it's 5.24. Um, um, well, we should have a, a stronger collaborative campaigning voice which challenges and changes not just about policy but about practice subject yeah i i'm gonna echo what joyce says i think solidarity is really really important i think also um working together with some of you know the larger and the smaller organizations i think that's really really important as well recognizing our specialisms um and um really you know it is about creating that change and that is why we're in the business it's about taking responsibility and being sometimes that lone voice as well in order just to, to to stand up very often we are but i think it's important that we keep talking we keep highlighting the inequalities and we and we we represent the women that we we support on a daily basis Thank you. Who wants to come in next? I will. Ross? 
Mm-hmm. I think I think working together is absolutely key. Women's organisations do it very well, and I think this is even more critical right now, even more critical than I can ever remember it. It is such a difficult environment out there. But at the same time, I think the pandemic has made so very clear the gender inequalities. It's exacerbated them for so many communities. I think there's a lot of very angry women out there, and I think it'd be great to sort of bring them into the fold. Hi, Dion. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to, I mean, for me, I think uh, we are needed more than ever now. And uh, Brexit and COVID-19 has shown the need for a stronger women's sector, particularly. And uh, effective partnerships is what is really needed. And to build on our strengths working together. And this is because we work at different levels and work with different communities. And it's really important that we build on our strengths. And that's about building solidarity with others and really um, ensuring that our voices are also heard. The collective and stronger voice is really needed more than ever. Shall I go next? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I I agree. Angry women, strong women, solidarity. But I think in a way we're we're talking sector um, uh, and it seems to me that we need to up our game because the world needs feminism and the world needs us more than it ever has before. It's not build, 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 it's care, care, care. We need a care economy and we need an economy in which we look after each other, ourselves and the planet. So it seems to me that these are the things that feminism has been talking about uh, for years and years. We've got a track record in doing this in community, in uh, in solidarity and, and all the things that people need right now. So I think we've got something to offer the world. We've got, um, you know, I don't know. Boris Johnson is already talking about world beating this, world beating that. We've got a world beating feminism and we need to get it out there and show people that the models that we've got are the ones that really work. And we were talking about, you know, uh, we're all pushing on a bit. It's 50s and 60s and there must be hundreds of, uh, uh, of years of experience on this Zoom that we've got. So we need to be really confident that they need us, not, you know, as as much as women need us, the world needs us. And we can be very confident now after after all this work that we put into it. So I think, although there's a lot of pressures and a lot of struggles on us right now, in a sense, the world's got a tipping point and people are looking for new answers because the old ones don't work and the the system is clearly bust. So I think now's our time, sisters, really. I feel, uh, you know, I feel optimistic, scared, but optimistic at the same time. Thank you so much, women. There's a lot there, lots to digest, and I don't even have enough time. Uh, I was told by my colleagues that uh, asking these questions, we wouldn't get, you know, we, people wouldn't, you wouldn't want to talk so much. Really? Really? No, I don't think so. I think what the next thing is, is for, um, the women who have been involved in the project um, and invite others to perhaps maybe look at those new systems. Um, Fantastic, thank you so much. And can you fill out the survey? I've been asked to the survey in the chat, if you could click on that and do the survey. Um, And we're hoping that funders are in the building. I don't know who's in the building, but it would be nice, Um, but certainly have those conversations and we need to have those conversations. And Vivian's now taking a different approach. Um, you might want to unmute and say something quickly. But I absolutely you know, agree that we need to have a different approach with funders. That they're actually buying a service from us. We're not, they think they're doing us a favour. Actually, they're purchasing something from us and it should be different, uh, that relationship. I like the idea of a revolution. Um, and uh, yeah, now's our time. Now is our time. So thank you to everyone. The cure. Feminism is the cure. Thank you, Susie. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, Yeah. 
So it's half past five. Um, the only thing about Zoom is everything just comes to an abrupt halt. Um, and it just seems like, yeah. So I just want to thank everyone for coming along today. I'd like to thank my team who made not only made this event happen, but actually made this project happen. Um, but we see this work being taken forward now in terms of the communications of it, what uh, the images, all the digital stuff, it happens now in terms of we're going to use social media uh, to really talk about the sector as the emergency fourth emergency service um and so yeah i just want to just want to put that out there that this doesn't stop for us this is the beginning so we might not have the funding but what we do have is the material and we need to um build the new systems women so thank you so much and thank you to all the women who are in here as well as those who are involved i see akima in here I'm seeing Vivian in here, who are also part of the project. But like I said, uh, thank you to Anita for doing the evaluation. We'll be able to get that out to all that want it, as well as uh, you'll be able to see some video clips and so on in the archives when it becomes available. Thank you to LSC. Uh, but yes, the journey has just begun. But let, it, let us uh, take the mantle. Thank you. Leon, I was just going to suggest, because I couldn't play the audio clip, should I play that as people are kind of leaving just at the end now? Yeah, why not? Oh, people sure. don't mind. This, so this is Marai um, um, Larasai, um, and I'm just going to play her clip that I couldn't quite get with the presentation. It just gives it less of a like, an abrupt end, if you know what I mean. <laughs> If you're going to say to me for more movement and for a sector, what do I think we need? Collaborative working versus the obsession with competition. Holding each other to account in ways that are caring and not about tearing strips of each other, off each other. Reflection, um, dialogue, passion, rage, all of those things. Um, but care, like genuine care. In terms of how I think I might have influenced change, I'd like to think by being a bit of a difficult but occasionally conciliatory human being, I'd like to think that um, my presence in the work has supported particularly younger activists. I know at different points in time, other Black women say to me, it's important that I've been here and that I am here, and that when they see me speaking somewhere, it gives them hope and it makes them feel like somebody is talking in ways that are connected to their bellies and their hearts. And so I think that that's probably the thing that I've brought. I've brought myself, my ancestors, my community, my body, and I think that's probably where I've had influence. And I'm argumentative and loving at the same time and I think that I hope that that's made a difference we've been forced to pretend like we're not invested in or liberation we've been forced to distance ourselves from the work and I'm not distant from it I'm not objective and I think if 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 you in truth if you say to me what I really bring it's the lack of objectivity because actually I am angry I'm pissed off I'm upset I'm hopeful I dream, I'm also terrified, I'm outraged, and at the same time, not outraged. I'm taken aback, but not surprised, all at the same time. And for me, telling the truth about that is perhaps the thing that I can do the best, you know, I can do most effectively. So the sector has been my joy and pain. <laughs> it has gave me life and energy and wisdom and healing, absolutely. And at the same time, it has exhausted me and had me, if not broken, then certainly dented at points. Um, I'd say I have lifelong sisterhood and community and allyship and friendships and all of that as a result of this work and being a part of this sector. I really see myself as 
having had the gift of being a part of something that is extraordinary, but it has also been painful and unbearable and disappointing and all of those things at the same time. We need to reclaim what or radical politics look like so it isn't hijacked by hate and what needs to be done is we need to end violence against us that's a huge undertaking and that's lifelong long work until we till we end intersecting oppressions like we're here for the long haul as far as i'm concerned Thanks, everybody. I'm going to end this event now, so there will be some the abrupt cut off. But thanks, everybody, so much um, for all of the LSE Library. So thanks. thank you.